My name is Joe Barr. I'm the director of the Traffic, Parking, and Transportation Department. Uh, and we'll be um, going through um, a presentation for you this evening on the current status of the design for the project. Um, but a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, one is there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation, which hopefully will take about 40, 45 minutes to get through. There's a lot of information in the presentation, and so we'd ask that folks hold questions until we're done, because it's very likely that questions you may have or things you may get uh, tripped up by may get explained later in the presentation. Like I said, we're more than happy to answer questions uh, towards the end, but we do want to try to get through the presentation uh, before we get into the questions. There will also be an opportunity so for some smaller groups, uh, breakout groups, uh, after the Q&A, hopefully by 7.15 or so, um, just if folks want to talk with staff or our consultants in more detail about specific issues or specific questions, uh, but we did also want to give folks an opportunity to sort of uh, um, ask us questions in a larger forum so that everyone can hear the answer to those more general questions. But again, if you have a very, very, very specific question, it may make sense to hold that until those group discussion groups. Uh, but obviously, you know, we'll, we'll take whatever questions we get uh, from all of you. Uh, I will mention a couple things about, we are being uh, videotaped th this evening by 22 City View. Um, so just an FYI on that. We are gonna ask folks to use the um, microphones when they're asking questions uh, so that they can get picked up for the uh, taping uh, and we people can watch that later uh, at home if they're having problems with insomnia perhaps. Um, I'll also mention we are joined by several of our elected officials this evening. Uh, Vice Mayor Devereaux is here along with Councilors Zondervan, Mallon, uh, and Siddiqui, and I don't think I've missed anybody else. Uh, we expect to be joined uh, later by the city manager who uh, plans to be here uh, and is on his way, um, but he's not here quite yet. Um, I also just remind folks if you can make sure you please sign in if you want to make, if you want to get continuing updates if you're not already on our mailing list about the project, future meetings, updates on where the project's going, and particularly as we move into construction at a later point, I uh, want to make sure folks can be updated about the construction process as that moves forward. Um, so with those uh, brief introductory remarks, I'll jump right into some background on the project, and then uh, Patrick Baxter and Kathy Watkins uh, are going to do most of the presentation this evening uh, to update you on where we're at. So we're going to talk about this background. We're going to uh, describe some work we've been doing over the last couple of months to evaluate concepts uh, for Inman Square. Uh, as some of you may know, we had a meeting scheduled for early December, which we delayed until tonight because we were looking back at some possible changes to the design, and so we want to share with you where we're at with those that analysis and kind of where we're heading in the future, and then we'll talk about next steps um, going forward. Um, just as a reminder about the timeline, we have been talking about improvements to Inman Square, well, in some form for many, many years, but in this current uh, analysis, really since uh, late 2014, early 2015, we started a more detailed study looking at traffic signal operations and safety issues uh, in 2015, uh, and then had a meeting about that uh, in June of 2016. Uh, and then, unfortunately, um, that around, right around that same time, we had a cyclist fatality uh, in Inman Square. And that kind of uh, reemphasized the need not to just study things, but actually to really try to get something done as quickly as we could to improve the square. Um, and so that led to really two different pieces. One is what we're in the midst of tonight, which is this kind of more significant redesign of Inman Square. But the other is we did make some changes to Inman Square, banning some left turns, better marking some of the bike lanes, uh, and trying to do what we could in the, sh in the immediate short term to improve safety. But I think it's really important uh, really to say two things. One is those safety improvements we have never felt were the full solution to what needs to change about Inman Square to make it as safe as possible. Uh, and also that we feel really every day that there are ongoing safety issues in Inman Square. And it's really critical uh, that we move a project forward, make changes to the square. Uh, it's not a good situation as it stands right now. And we do want to make sure that we continue to move forward forward with changes that will resolve those safety issues. Um, so since then, we've been working on this more significant capital project uh, and been having a series of public meetings on that um, since really uh, early last year. Um, so like I said, we're up to our fourth public meeting uh, this evening uh, and wanted to kind of share where we're at. Um, just to remind folks, that, ex in that initial transportation study identified a number of issues uh, that we're trying to 
uh, address. Uh, you know, the most important, as I said, is really the one at the bottom about the, the rate of crashes and the safety concerns occurring. Yeah, there's, there's not a way to do that interactively. So we will make this presentation available online uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so, uh, but you know, there are also complaints about delay for really all modes, uh, both drivers, but also I think very importantly, pedestrians and cyclists moving through the square. Uh, and we just know that the way the intersection is today, it's a very large intersection with almost a football field's length between the stop bars in either direction on the main streets. And any intersection that, that, that is that large is inherently going to operate inefficiently. Uh, and so the solution very quickly in that initial transportation study became clear that we could not solve this just with retiming the traffic lights or making other tweaks to the intersection. We really needed to look more fundamentally at the design, and that's, like I said, kind of what led us to this, uh, the situation we're in today of trying to do a more significant project. Um, you know, there's, there's cl clearly issues with where the locations of crosswalks. Um, as I said, the, the size of the intersection is very large. We have this very strange situation, I would say, on Antrim Street where or on Hampshire Street coming to Antrim, where you know, they're, you're traveling sort of through a, tra a signalized intersection, but there's not, not actually a signal controlling that movement, uh, and that's something we really want to resolve. Um, and just in general, the intersection operates in, you know, frankly, what I would say is almost a, is a fairly chaotic way, uh, and that's just not a recipe for uh, safety and, and, and clear operations. So th that leads us really to this, which is the primary goal of this project uh, is, is to improve safety in the intersection. And uh, about a year and a half ago, the city adopted a commitment to Vision Zero, which is saying that we are working to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries in our transportation system. Uh, and that's a goal that we take very, very seriously. Uh, and so it really is important to say that that goal does rise above other goals in what we're trying to accomplish with this project. All that said, there's a lot of other things we are trying to get done. Uh, in addition to making it safer for all of these users, we're trying to uh, make it more convenient and easier to use, reduce some of those large crosswalks, better accommodate folks' desires to travel in more direct paths, uh, and, and have crosswalks that really connect the key destinations, with destinations within the square. And we want to try to avoid, to the extent we can, conflicts between different uh, types of users. So if we can give pedestrians or give cyclists a more protected way to move through the intersection, that's really a benefit to their safety, which will further encourage those users to, to travel by those sustainable modes. Uh, we are trying to make it work a little bit better for cars. That's not a primary goal, but we do want to make sure that we've you know, reduced delay for motor vehicles to the extent we can, and, and importantly, make it very clear how to move through the intersection. Uh, and also, we want to make sure that we limit the impact on parking. Uh, you know, we, we understand that the parking in the square is a very important element of what makes it successful as a business location, and we want to continue to encourage that. Uh, so, so the parking impacts are very critical to us. At the same time, we are looking at transit. There are a number of bus routes that travel through the square, uh, particularly the 69 bus on Cambridge Street is a relatively busy, busy route that we think could be busier if it ran a little bit more reliably uh, and perhaps a little bit more frequently. So we are trying to create better, um, or create priority for buses and better facilities for buses moving through the square. Uh, we've also heard a lot as we've gone through this project about people's experience of using the open space or the plaza space, uh, particularly Veluchi Plaza, and looking for improvements in that experience and the quality of, of, the, of the plaza space. Um, and even though we would probably love to see fewer trucks, at least moving through Inman Square, we know that those trucks are going to continue to be there. There's a lot of deliveries happening to Inman Square. There's businesses in Inman, Inman Square that make deliveries from that location. And so truck access is something we need to definitely preserve and, and if, if anything, try to enhance, uh, at least for the local access. Uh, and then, again, uh, probably something that everyone, including the fire department, would like to change, but not something that we're at, see any opportunity to change. We do have a, a fire station located right in the heart of the square, which is operationally very challenging for everybody, but it's there. We need to accommodate that use, and obviously it's a significant public safety issue to make sure that that fire station can continue to operate effectively um, going forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Baxter, who is the engineering manager in my department, to talk more about the, the concepts that we've been working on. 
So I'm just going to go through um, a couple different things that we've been looking at. So first, you're going to see up here on the screen, we have the current concept. If you've been to our previous meetings, you've likely seen this concept as it's gone through several layers of revision. It was one of the um, initial concepts that we saw back in January when we were looking at four different alternatives. Um, and then we were moving through the design process. Uh, this was finalized as the preferred concept back in the spring of 2017. Um, so that said, over the last few months, we had heard from several um, groups of business owners and residents that they had significant concerns uh, about some of the issues with this concept. And they asked us to kind of go back to the drawing board, take a look and see, is there a way that we can accomplish all of the goals of this project or the majority of the goals, especially those related to safety, while reducing the impacts on Volucci Plaza and possibly providing some improved truck loading opportunities. So we did go back to the drawing board, and we were able to pull together this alternative concept, uh, which is a variation on one of the concepts that was originally shown back in January of 2017. Uh, what we did was we worked with the consultants to identify several of the changes that were made through that process, um, through the public process, what we heard from residents and business owners um, to improve those concepts. You'll see here um, some of the changes we brought into the plan include the two-way Springfield Street. We heard very strongly from residents of Somerville that um, they did not like the idea of a one-way Springfield Street, which was originally shown in most of the other concepts back in January. Uh, we did look at the opportunities for a transit priority lane on Cambridge Street, similar to what is shown in the preferred concept. And again, this maintains the alignment of Hampshire Street and kind of bends Cambridge Street around to meet it. Uh, as opposed to the preferred concept uh, from the previous meetings, which kind of did the reverse of bending Hampshire Street around to meet Cambridge Street, carrying Cambridge Street through on a straight alignment. This allows Volucci Plaza to remain in the existing location. Um, however, it does have several significant concerns, which I'm going to go through uh, as we move through this presentation. So going back to the current concept, um, one key feature of the signal phasing for the current concept is it restores the left turns that were banned in November of 2016 as a response to some of the safety concerns in the intersection. It does so, it keeps those turns as a protected movement, so there's a separate lane for vehicles waiting to make a turn if they're going from Hampshire Street to Cambridge Street in either direction. They're able to enter the intersection uh, and then make that turn through the, uh, the intersection. So you start off with a phase for Cambridge Street, vehicles, uh, excuse me, for Hampshire Street, uh, they go through the intersection. You get a through phase where the turns are protected from Cambridge Street. Uh, that means the right turns receive a right signal indication that allows pedestrians and bicycles to move on concurrent movements without having to worry about conflicting turns. We've got a phase to allow vehicles to exit from Springfield Street, and then we've got the through vehicles for Hampshire Street. And again, those vehicles are able to stop within the intersection in those center lanes and wait for the, the phase where they're able to continue and complete that left turn. While looking at the alternative concept, um, it became apparent that it is necessary to maintain the left turn restrictions in order to allow this intersection to operate um, safely and efficiently for all users of the intersection. So it would start off with a phase for through vehicles on Hampshire Street. You've got in each phase a brief clearance phase which allows vehicles to exit the intersection and then it moves on to Cambridge Street. Um, this kind of brings up one, um, as, as we're, we've been thinking about it, a really fatal flaw with this intersection in that it requires drivers within the intersection, depending on which street they arrive from, to see uh, a very different condition and operation of the intersection. So what I'm gonna show you here is what you're seeing as you're a vehicle, you, you've come down from Somerville, you've entered on the Hampshire Street approach, you go through the first signal, you get a green signal indication, you come to the second intersection, as we have indicated, the left turns are prohibited. So you'll see an electronic sign that says no left turn, and you'll see a straight arrow. Your only option at the location is to continue moving straight. Similar to what you see today, you're not allowed to stop and turn left. Um, if you do so, you're blocking up the intersection. Um, you're stopping, you're waiting, and then the vehicles behind you aren't able to pass. Uh, you're causing safety issues behind you as vehicles might stop and queue up through the intersection. And if you do choose to disregard that signal indication, you're then crossing through an oncoming stream of vehicles, a stream of bicycles, a stream of pedestrians, another stream of bicycles, and another stream of pedestrians. So you know, making that left turn at that time is certainly not a safe maneuver. 
following up on that phase, Cambridge Street receives the green signal indication. So a Cambridge Street vehicle moving eastbound headed towards Leachmere comes into the intersection, makes a right turn into the inter internal intersection, and then makes a left turn out. So if you remember previously, a car on Hampshire Street saw a no left turn sign. The Cambridge Street vehicle sees a green left turn arrow. That sets up kind of a, a confusing issue with the intersection in that the Cambridge Street driver is being told they're allowed to turn left and they have a protected phase, they get a green arrow, while the Hampshire Street driver is being told you're not allowed to turn left, you must proceed straight. This is a little bit different from what we typically see um, in other intersections across the city where we either have a full time left turn restriction like you see in Central Square from Mass Ave at Prospect Street, you're never allowed to turn left or other locations where you might have a protected left turn, you see a red left arrow, that means you stop, you wait, you'll get your indication, and you're able to proceed. In this location, the Hampshire Street driver is seeing a very different indication, and if they disregard that, they're causing safety issues, and they're log jamming the intersection so people aren't able to get through. Um, looking at the traffic signal cycle, they're overall fairly similar. Um, today, one of the issues we've heard from a lot of people, you've got the very long cycle, which is a function of the very large seven-leg intersection. As Joe mentioned, it's almost a football field between the stop bars on the Cambridge Street approaches and the Hampshire Street approach. So we have an existing 160-second cycle. Uh, for purpose of comparison, typically we target a maximum of 90 seconds for a signal cycle in Cambridge. Under the current concept, we have that down to 90 seconds during both the morning and the afternoon peak hours. For the alternative concept, we are slightly longer at about 120 seconds in the morning and 100 seconds in the afternoon. However, in both cases, you are below the 160 seconds for the existing condition. So thinking about our evaluation criteria in comparing these concepts both now and earlier on in this process, we were looking at items like uh, plaza space within the intersection, uh, the tree canopy, maintaining environmental goals in terms of urban heat island, um, alignment with Vision Zero, where, where, you know, as our primary goal here is really to make a safe intersection that able, everybody is clearly able to understand. Um, that really mandates that the intersection be clear and intuitive for all users. Uh, we're looking to reduce travel delay for all modes. We especially find with pedestrians, the longer you have to wait, the more likely you are to get frustrated and perhaps walk against the don't walk signal and then cause a potential safety issue in those crosswalks. Uh, we are also looking at transit improvement opportunities. And then, of course, the curb use, looking to maintain as many of the existing parking spaces as possible and ensure that we have loading zones for all the, the vehicles delivering to all the businesses in the square. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kathy Watkins to talk a little bit about the plaza. Hi, so I'm Kathy Watkins from Public Works. I just want to go through, so the evaluation criteria, particularly looking at the plaza space and the tree canopy, because that's really where a lot of the differences are between these, um, these two options, and particularly why people had asked us to sort of go back and relook at um, what are options that have different plaza impacts and different options for the plaza. Um, and which is the red button? This one? The top one. The top one, okay. Um, so when we initially started this project, we asked people, you know, there was a survey and it was very general and, you know, it asked people about sort of, do you think Volucci Plaza should stay the way it is today? And we heard pretty strongly from people that there are a number of things that don't work in the plaza. And so we could talk about different ways of um, addressing those concerns, but overall there's a lot of concerns with how the plaza operates today. Kathy, was that an it was. It was online as well as at meetings and other places. So again, it's not a scientific survey. It's one we've heard from the Neighborhood Association. We've heard from um, individual surveys. So it's not in any way a scientific response, but there was about 450 responses. Um, and so just thinking about how the plaza operates today. Oops. Does that not work? Um, so this is an image of the plaza today, and you know, it was renovated a little over 10 years ago, and the intent at that time had really been to open it up, make it more inviting, have people really use the space, and I think it certainly operates better than it did before, um, but it still is not a particularly heavily used space, and is very disconnected from the businesses and the rest of the square, so it's certainly one of the things we've heard about why this plaza isn't more animated and more utilized, is sort of the disconnection from the rest of the square. And so we think about you know, what makes successful plazas and what makes people have them activated and want to use them. And you know, this was a conversation we started at the last meeting to talk about plazas. And you know, we want spaces that are flexible, functional, 
um, memorable, that are really interesting and sort of draw people into the space, have active users. And I think you know one of the things we've heard about Volucci Plaza is really concerned about connections to the adjacent businesses and wanting to be able to support those local businesses. Um, so these are some images that we've looked at when we think about you know, what could plazas be, and some of these are in Cambridge, um, and really just thinking about what draws people to spaces and makes it that memorable open space and wants to be something that people want to come back to with their kids and hang out. So again, if we think about the existing Volucci Plaza, it's about 6,500 square feet um, in a contiguous space here. And again, it's part of it is it's very disconnected from the streets, from the other businesses, and difficult to get to. So the current concept, going back to sort of um, the, the discussion Patrick was having, the current concept maintains a smaller Volucci Plaza on the existing side, and then shifts sort of an, an additional Volucci Plaza to the other side that's more adjacent to the businesses. And you know, there's some pros and cons here, and I just want to talk through those a little bit. You know, one of the pros we've heard from people is that you know, this puts the open space adjacent to more active commercial businesses, has a better chance of being activated and heavily utilized, an opportunity to support the local businesses. One of the big concerns is that it impacts the street trees and then splits up the open space into two different parcels instead of one larger parcel. So then we look at the alternative concept. And with the alternative concept, it maintains Volucci Plaza in its current location. And then it also adds a little bit of an additional open space down here, plaza space. So we have a total of about 7,300 square footage. This space, um, you know, it's next to what's not a very active use. And so, you know, there's some discussion about how active that space would be. But the overall amount of open space would be higher. And then we think about tree canopy, which is the other uh, the thing that's impacted by the current proposal. And so the current proposal impacts these first four larger trees in Volucci Plaza. So there's six trees along the outside of Volucci Plaza. The two in the back remain, and the four in the front would need to be removed for that realignment. So this is an image that just shows, again, an outline of the existing street trees in the area to give people an overall image of what the tree canopy is in Inman Square. So again, the alternative concept would maintain those existing trees in Volucci Plaza, as well as maybe an opportunity for some additional you know, plantings in this space as well. So there is an opportunity to maintain those existing street trees. The current concept, and again, removes these four, um, it's an opportunity to do additional plantings here in the newer Volucci Plaza. And so we have some images showing, you know, we haven't done the detailed design, and that's a conversation we want to have with people, but this gives sort of an imagery of what the plantings could be. Um, and so if you're sort of looking into the future, what, is the, what do those trees look like? And then I'll also come back and talk a little bit about the Springfield City parking lot and some changes we've been looking at with that in terms of overall tree canopy. And the one thing I just really want to highlight is that as we look at doing new tree plantings in a new plaza, we really look at what are the details that we're doing those plantings in. So um, these are some images showing some recent construction. This one's on Main Street and Kendall Square, where we did ex extensive excavation. And that's all for the support of the street trees that went in. So we removed all that soil, brought in sand-based structural soil to support the new street trees, and to really provide the as high a quality planting area as we can for these trees, particularly in these dense urban areas that do have a harder time. Um, and so as we look at the project, we would look at protecting the existing street trees with protection of the tree during construction, air spading of roots, and then as we look at the new trees, we would look at you know, extensive sand-based structural soil, make sure we have a system for watering, and make sure they can really thrive over time. So these are some images on Western Avenue, which had a pretty extensive sand-based structural soil and has been in place for about two to three years. And what you see is that these trees here, there's some existing trees, the larger trees. These trees here, which have the gator bags on the bottom, are actually new street trees. And those have done really well. So if you go up and down um, Western Avenue, particularly in May or June, once the trees come back out, you'll see that these tree plantings have done really well in that environment. Um, as we looked at, OK, so we have this current proposal, and it does impact tree canopy. And what are the ways that we can address that looking broadly at Inman Square? So we've looked at what are the tree details of what we're planting in the plazas, but also in the overall 
in Men's Square, what can we do, we do to increase tree canopy and reduce urban heat island? And so we expanded the project a little bit to look at, there's this city parking lot on Springfield Street, which is very barren and is a hot black asphalt. And so we looked at an option that would increase some, um, decrease the amount of paving and add new trees into the parking lot. And so again, to try to look at how do we make this overall a benefit. Um, and then Patrick will talk a little bit later, but you know, we really looked at the parking lot in terms of adding street trees. And during that process, we looked at the layout of the parking lot and were able to actually add um, a number of additional parking spaces. So it helps us on the parking count, but it also helps us looking at the overall tree planting in the broader Inman Square area. So if we look at the current concept and say, you know, after, you know, when the project is first completed, we'd have about 85% of the tree canopy that we have today. When we look at 10 years down the road, depending on how those trees thrive, we would have 100 to 135 percent of the overall tree canopy. And so we're really committed to mitigating any of those impacts. Um, this is sort of a general, and this is, applies a little bit to some of the things we've been talking about, but you know, really thinking about the environmental benefits of the project and going back a little bit to the safety message, which is that as we make it safer and more comfortable for people to bike and walk and take transit, it really is an opportunity to encourage more people to take those modes and drive less um, and reduce emissions. So both of those are options. You know, both of the, that's really a, a driver of this project. Um, and one thing I didn't talk about is that we've looked at you know, using lighter colored pavers at the, both of the plaza reconstructed areas, as well as, you know, is there an opportunity for maybe some um, cooling, cooler paving um, coating that we haven't tried in the city, but on the parking lot, is this an opportunity to try that to, again, to further those overall goals? So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Patrick to go through a little bit more in details about the other goals and criteria. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. So just coming back to the safety issue, um, you know, safety is the basis of this project. This was started in response to the issues that we were seeing in the intersection with a very high crash rate, um, especially for vulnerable users, bicyclists, pedestrians traveling through the intersection. Um, so looking at the crash data, we saw some of the most common crash types. We had the rear end crashes, angle crashes, side swipe, and then the bicycle and pedestrian involved crashes, um, which again frequently result in injuries. So looking at the current concept, I um, just want to kind of go walk through it and kind of see how the, the concept addresses each of these types of crashes. Yes, so what I, this is, this is I'm sorry. Absolutely. I, I, so when I talk about the current concept, I'm talking about the concept that we have presented at the last several meetings. Okay. And then when I talk about the alternative concept, I'm talking about the one that we had kind of went back to the drawing board to take a look and find a concept that did not impact Volucci but Plaza. It's new to us. Correct. It's sort of like old and new. Yeah. So the current concept um, addresses the Bicycle crashes through the separated bicycle lanes through the intersection. It has what we call a protected intersection treatment, where you have the offset crossing. Um, vehicles, as they turn, are able to look back and see a bicycle. Uh, a bicycle is able to see a vehicle turning through um, and observe that conflict, and both are able to kind of react and stop before a potential crash. We have improved clearance intervals. So again, as I mentioned, uh, today the intersection is very large and anybody that's gone through there, um, especially on foot as you walk through some of the crosswalks, you'll see that you know, occasionally a vehicle will get trapped in the intersection. So the light turns red. We have a very long clearance interval today. Um, even then, given the size of the intersection, sometimes vehicles end up still in the intersection. When pedestrians get their walk signal, a pedestrian starts across the crosswalk and there's still a vehicle trying to exit the intersection. The smaller intersections allow us to shrink those clearance intervals and still make sure we're able to get vehicles out of the intersection prior to pedestrians entering. 
Um, the current concept restores the protected left turn movements. Uh, those turns are protected, so we don't have the crash types we were seeing prior to implementing the left turn restriction. Uh, we're able to accommodate those in a safe way um, and ensure that people aren't making an illegal move and adding some further confusion and unexpected maneuvers through the intersection. We've got improved signage and lane markings throughout the intersection. Again, having the smaller intersections allow us to place signs in more uh, conspicuous locations um, and have everything make a little more sense to all the users traveling through. We've got protected bicycle and pedestrian crossings across Hampshire Street. So when those pedestrians are walking across Hampshire Street, there are not vehicles turning across those movements. Um, and again, we've got protected intersection space for the vehicles making the right turns. So looking at the alternative concept, overall you'll see it's very similar. We've got the separated bicycle lanes, we've got the protected crossings, improved signage and lane markings. Um, the one critical issue that we see is we still maintain that left turn prohibition and the, the potential for vehicles to disregard that prohibition or misunderstand it um, result in a, a significant safety concern. Vehicles might make that illegal left turn, they might stop and wait to make the left turn. This really presents kind of a fatal flaw we've created an intersection that is not kind of safe and understandable for the everyday driver. Um, if we're creating a situation that's confusing, then we're not creating a safer intersection. So we've also been talking about the transit improvement priorities. Again, we have the uh, 69 and the 83 bus that travel through on Cambridge Street and Hampshire Street, respectively. Um, the current concept does include a transit lane on the eastbound Cambridge Street approach. That is actually one of the highest segments of delay for MBTA buses in the city. The, you know, there's significant delay, sometimes several minutes per bus that are traveling through the intersection that you know, is both inconvenient for riders and also results in some people choosing not to take the bus as the travel times are not reliable. So as you saw in the concept, it does include that bus lane that allows the buses to bypass the queue of vehicles that are waiting at the light um, and enter the intersection prior to vehicles. It would also receive an exclusive transit signal that allows it to bypass that queue, enter the center intersection, and then continue on down Cambridge Street. We did also look for the alternative concept at providing a bus lane on the approach. However, as you saw in the rendering of the alternative concept, we ultimately were not able to provide that. Um, what we found was you've got a significant issue at the approach entering the intersection. You've got two lanes here. You've got the vehicle lane and the bus lane. But then as they come around the curve, you've only got the single lane at the internal intersection. So there's no space for the bus and the vehicle to merge. We did look at um, options to change the signal phasing to ensure that a bus and a vehicle don't enter at the same time. But at that point, you're delaying the bus so much in preventing it from merging with the vehicles that the benefit of the bus lane has been removed by the, the delay for the signal. <coughs> so looking at analysis of what that bus lane does for transit riders, we're looking at an average savings of 50 seconds per vehicle traveling through the intersection. So each bus that travels through during that morning peak hour is going to save 50 seconds on the approach as they're able to come up to the intersection. You have a line of vehicles approximately 300 feet long. They're able to move into the transit lane, bypass those vehicles. They get the exclusive signal. They move into the intersection. Uh, they save a little bit of time. You've got a lot of riders on that bus, so you're really resulting in a net improvement to delay for people traveling through the intersection. Comparing the two concepts on parking, we're finding that they're very similar in the end. We've kind of worked through to identify as many spaces as possible as we're able to retain. We're seeing about 80% of the spaces within the square retained in both concepts. Um, you'll see in the current concept, you do have that transit lane on the eastbound Cambridge Street approach. That's intended to be a peak hour only lane. So from say 7 to 9 or 7 to 10, that would be a transit lane. And then after that time, it will be available for vehicles to park, so you're maintaining that parking um, during the hours when most of the businesses are typically open. Um, again, I've already gone through these, but just re reminding everybody about our evaluation criteria, um, and most importantly, the safety and alignment with Vision Zero. I also want to walk through some of the, the updates we've made to the current concept since the July 2017 meeting for those that have been following along all through this process. We heard a lot of comments from members of the public about desires for additional crosswalks, changes to some of the circulation elements. So the first one is an additional crosswalk 
from the corner of Antrim Street over to the relocated plaza. We heard from uh, many users of the square they'd like to see a crossing there. The previous concept had crossings on the west leg and the north leg, but did not provide a crosswalk to get directly to the plaza. So we were able to kind of change how the bike lane alignment works to be able to provide that crosswalk. Um, we heard from several residents of Antrim Street that they were concerned with the proposed reversal. The original concept had reversed Antrim Street, which is presently one way southbound, to make that one way northbound. Um, we heard those concerns, so we're now showing Antrim Street as a one way southbound street as it is today. We had also heard um, from a lot of people about the desirability of having a crosswalk parallel to Cambridge Street in front of the firehouse, uh, which is a desire line today that you presently have to walk down past Inman Street and then kind of come back up across Hampshire Street. Uh, we looked at that, however, we simply find that adding that crosswalk, we create a very long crosswalk. It'd be the longest crosswalk in the square by a pretty wide margin. That actually requires us to increase the cycle length and delay all the other crosswalks. And in the end, you actually increase the delay for pedestrians at all of the other crosswalks to accommodate this one new crosswalk. So in the end, as you're traveling through the square, you're actually, under the current concept, save a little more time by walking down to this crosswalk at the south side of the firehouse than having that crosswalk there. Um, you also have potential ramp issues as the kind of pedestrian signal and ramp are right at the corner where the fire engines are exiting the firehouse. That said, this concept does provide better crosswalk alignment. Presently, you have to walk down to the far side of Inman Street and then kind of walk on a long diagonal back. So now you have a shorter crosswalk that's a little bit closer to the, the line of travel for pedestrians. We've also heard um, about concerns about the impacts to parking created by some of the bus stops more on the west side of the square. So we had heard from um, residents of the condominiums located on the north side of Lucci Plaza. There was originally a bus stop in this location and the, the resulting impact of that bus stop was that there was no curbside access for a vehicle to stop for pick up and drop off, um, short term parking, uh, or you know potential moving activities. So we shifted that bus stop to the far side of the intersection to allow us to restore some of the parking there and ensure that there is some parking within the city of Cambridge as, as soon as you kind of go north off of this map, you're actually in Somerville. Uh, we also heard similar concerns about parking availability at the uh, pharmacy and the other adjacent businesses. So we again shifted the bus stop that was on the eastbound approach, um, Cambridge Street at Hampshire Street, over to the far side of the intersection where there is additional parking as well as providing that bus stop. Um, we also heard the concerns about the, the, the trees that, you know, the potential tree removals that are happening uh, within Volucci Plaza. So as Kathy mentioned, we're looking at some concepts where we're providing both additional trees and additional parking within the Springfield Street parking lot. Uh, we're able to do that by reducing the currently oversized parking aisle widths down to the, the typical that you see in other parking lots throughout the city, providing some additional parking along the back side of the fence, and then providing some trees down the center of the aisle. So with that, um, next steps, we're going to be looking at a community meeting in March to talk about the plaza design. Um, we're going to be finalizing the design and the concept through the spring. Um, there will be some permitting involved uh, in the changes to the plaza. Uh, and then we're hoping for a spring summer for a final open house for the design. So with that, if we can uh, turn some lights back on. And um, I guess before we start the q and I just wanted to say a couple of final things. Um, one was, um, you know, when we sent out the meeting invite for this meeting a few weeks ago, um, at that point in time, we very much were in the process of doing all this analysis. And at that point, we, I think, were um, feeling like both the current concept and the alternative concept were potentially, obviously, the, the current concept we know we, 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 we can make work, that the, the alternative we were developing was something that we felt was um, plausible and, and safe and workable alternative. Um, however, in the time since that meeting notice went out and tonight, we've, you know, like we've literally been working on our, the, our analysis and putting together the presentation and the information we're sharing this evening up until uh, today, literally. Um, and as we went through that analysis in more detail and really dived down into some of the safety issues, 
Um, just to be clear, as Patrick said, we found that the, the alternative had a fatal flaw to it. There's many pros and many cons to both alternatives, but looking at safety, uh, being serious about our commitment to Vision Zero, we did not feel comfortable that that was something, or we do not believe that that's something we can move forward with uh, as an option that would be safe. Uh, as I think Patrick mentioned, you know, it were, we would be creating an intersection that day one out of the box would have a confusing and potentially hazardous operation, uh, and so that's just not something that we feel uh, or that we, we want to move forward with. Um, and so with that, I, well, can you, if you can let me finish, you, maybe you may. So while all that to say that the, our, our plan for moving forward, and again, to go back to uh, the next step slide, is to move forward with the current concept, the concept that we've been discussing uh, for really at this point going on uh, six months, uh, or over six months really, uh, that uh, was shown at the end that Patrick was referring to, the modifications we've made to more recently. And so I guess what I would say, and again, we're happy to answer questions uh, about this, but you know, we really did try to come up with the best version of a design that would not have an impact on Vellucci Plaza and its current footprint. And at this point, we don't feel like we have a safe design that does that. And so we are intending to move forward with the design that does the changes to Vellucci Plaza and all the other elements that were part of the, um, the, what we we're referring to in this meeting as the current concept and that that's what we're intending to move forward with. So I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, very clear to folks in terms of what, what our plan is moving forward. Um, and like I said, we really did believe that this was something we could make work and subsequently really just cannot recommend it uh, as something that we would, we would build uh, at this point in time. So with that, we can move on to Q&A.